are you two going to welcome me to L.A.? <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Los Angeles. Oh, oh, wow, gracias. Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, pod crushers. Yes. <laughs> I'm Unironically, it. just loves it now. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what else to say. Hello, welcome to Podcrushed. Sophie, you are, uh, how, how, how far along are you now? I'm six months. You're six week. months. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I, you know what? I actually thought it was a little bit longer. So that's, I mean, really, that's, it still, feels like still, it's still, flying you, by. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. You wait till you have them. Then it's yeah. every day is so long and so quick at the same time. <laughs> um, ha, you know, it just occurred to me. Uh, something we were talking about before. I know you're a very spiritual person. We talk about our faith here a lot on the show. We're all Baha'is. Um, so we know that our identity is not ultimately in the body, but mm-hmm. there's but but you are pregnant. You're a you're a person who's who's now got another person inside of you. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have that person soon. You're gonna have a child. How how is it changing the way you think about your body? Hmm. Can I ask mm-hmm. that? Yeah, yeah, totally. It has really changed the way I think about my body. I think I have always felt very insecure about my body. I've and I've talked about this on the podcast too. I've mm-hmm. I've also just had a warped perception of my body for my whole life. And I know that because I'll look back at pictures and think like who is that? I that's not what I thought my body looked like at that time. Like I can remember this specific moment in this mm-hmm. photo how I was feeling about my tummy about my arms about my legs whatever it is and now that I'm looking at this picture which is like objective it doesn't it doesn't match so I know that I've always had a warped perception and in pregnancy I've been very like aware of my body and I would think that that would make me more insecure about my body but actually it's done the opposite mm. and it makes me feel like I just I'm seeing it for what it is. I I've been taking pictures. I'm an artist, so I also want to document this pregnancy. I want to like use it for art as well. Not use it, but you know, create art from it. And so You're exploiting your child already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I understand. Already. yeah you're gonna Before go to she's born. <laughs> <laughs> now I've been taking daily pictures, pretty much daily. And that has been incredible. I actually would recommend it to somebody who feels like they don't really see their body accurately. Um, it just, you're like, okay, that's a body. That's what my body looks like. And you're not creating like a narrative about it in your mind that is judgmental. It's just what it is. I feel, I would like to have a, a daily shot of me <laughs> without my shirt on every day since I've had our youngest, just to see this skinny, um, man's soft, uh, a dad flat tire. Just start to grow and fluctuate. It actually would look like when the plants and planet Earth are just blossoming and they're unfurling and furling, uh, unfurling like a stop and furling. Motion. It's just like every just you, you just see my torso just billowing in stop motion. Yeah. <laughs> Try it. Uh, yeah, that's. I feel like that just would make sure it's in be. a locked folder. Uh, <laughs> I thought we were talking about body neutrality. So thanks. All right. Well, let's get to our guest. What are you writing now? You're writing some notes. Some notes. She's like. Kill I'm just drawing. Kill pen. pen. <laughs> Replace with Chase. Dog. I already know who I want. <laughs> that, was, that was quick. There's no... That was a little too quick. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No. Uh, no. Today's guest. Uh, we 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 really did have a, a special time. Bobby Burke. He's the creative force behind the incredible home transformations on that show on Queer Eye. Uh, uh, his his compassion, his humor, his kindness made today's episode a very lively profound, uh, deep conversation. So so you're not going to want to miss it. Stick around. Welcome to Pod Crushed. We're your hosts. I'm Penn. I'm Nava. And I'm Sophie. And I think we could have been your middle school besties. Feng shuiing our room with posters of teenage heartthrobs like Elijah Wood. I would have done hating Christians in. Ooh. <laughs> Let's acknowledge that our guest today, Bobby Burke, brought Brought a dog, a beautiful, <laughs> quiet, yeah. well-trained. Yeah. We sometimes we call her Ninja because you don't hear her. No, she's a like, perfect oh, little you dog. From? That's so nice. Ben is regretting all his choices in dogs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We got shout out to Terrence and Lobo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only they could hear me. Um, <laughs> they can. They're listening at home. They're plotting their revenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you don't know the story with Terrence. Yeah, he probably yeah. is. He's been with my mother He's for like, a year. Where can I? <laughs> I'm gonna poop right yeah. on his pillow. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what we like to do is we like to start at twelve. 
because depending on depending on where you are now, depending on what you do, I mean, you know, we we often have like artists and performers, which you know, you definitely fit into that category. I mean, you're you're both. So for you, you know, were you were you already becoming the person who would discover design? I mean, were you were you like were you were you building things, or were you like more of an artist? Oh, what were you? Builder. You know what I mean? Builder, okay. builder, builder. Mm. Um, I used to always get in trouble before school because I would not be getting ready for school. I'd be upstairs playing with my Legos. Okay. <laughs> and like the fact that I'm now actually am a Lego. Like there's a Queer Eye. Are Legos. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a Queer Eye wow. Lego. That's amazing. That we're the second show. The first it was Friends and then they did Queer Eye. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, they've done That's other incredible. shows since then. But yeah, like Goosebumps. It yeah. was yeah. a very amazing full circle moment yeah. for me because like wow. my Legos were my life. And building with Legos, building outside, you know, with my Hot Wheels, I would build like these massive cities outside with boxes mm -hmm. and right. dirt roads and then I'd burn them all down and I'd build them again. And yeah. Burn them down. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean you I live in the country. I live in the <laughs> there, was, there was not much to do. There was not much to do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, even even when I was before 12, I was, you know, decorated. I mean, one of the things I talk about in my book is the very first time I realized that color had an effect on you, mm. I was probably like five or six. And my mother had my bedroom decorated in all red. Mm. Red curtains, red bedspread, red pillows, That's red rug. That's extreme. It was. Yeah. And it always made me anxious. Yeah, is that yeah. what does red do? Yeah, red makes it. you anxious. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm looking like at angry, your shirt anxious. right now and I'm getting <laughs> so anxious. I'm beautiful. So Everybody knows it's a beautiful <laughs> shirt. Red is absolutely is it, her color. It is not mine. But is it, it's not just, I mean, is it only, I mean, is that like the predominant? Mm. Is it, I feel like there's other, th I've heard other things because I know McDonald's like uses red. And it, isn't it, isn't it like does a it make hunger, you hungry? Hunger? Maybe, maybe, maybe that, maybe yeah, that was passion. it. Maybe it wasn't anxiety, maybe I was hungry. Yeah, yeah. But I remember like saving up all the little $20 checks my aunts would send me for my birthday to buy a new bedspread. Something that isn't red. Like blue. Because right. wow. I just felt like blue was soothing. And yeah. I had found this dinosaur poster that had all these different blues in it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to design my room around this poster. Are you possibly known for a particular shade of blue? Uh, I have seen fans the first few seasons call it Bobby Blue. Right. Yeah. Because I <laughs> apparently I... Painted a lot of stuff blue the first yeah. few seasons. Uh, we, you know, there's only a certain amount of colors that you know you can paint someone's house and they're not yeah. going to walk in and be like, what did you do? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was yeah. just with a, a, a really talented producer and a video game designer who's a very visual person. Mm -hmm. And um, he said right before this, uh, when I said it was you, he was like, oh, Bobby Burke, I love him. Tell him I love his blue. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby Blue. So, yeah, I guess that's... Actually, looking back, I used to have a friend whose name was Bobby Blue. So, Bobby name. Blue, if you yeah. are out there... Him. Mm. Hello. Sounds like a stage <laughs> name. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't sound real. Or a baseball player. Bobby Blue on the yeah. mound. Mm. Everybody used to say my name sounded like a baseball player or a porn star. So. <laughs> and you've landed somewhere directly right. in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. closer to the closer to porn star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby, I want to know what were you like at school with your friends? Sort of, who were you hanging out with? What were you dreaming about? So, kindergarten through sixth grade. I went to a little one room. Well, it wasn't one room. It was two rooms because kindergarten was in its own room. But then first through 12th grade was in one room. Wow. And it was this little private Christian church school literally mm -hmm. out in the sticks. Um, I was the only person in my grade. There was only, I think, 19 kids in the whole school. The only person in your grade? Was that Sorry, each I just, year? <laughs> like every year moment. were you the only person I, yeah, in your grade? I was the only person in my grade. You know, yeah. I will tell you that I had... A few months at a school in the sticks in Washington State, just yeah. like that, like where I was the only person in the grade. Yeah. Little house on the very prairie weird. type stuff. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Um, and there wasn't a teacher that like stood up and taught the whole class because obviously everybody would be working on different stuff. We had these workbooks that we worked in, yeah. and everybody okay. sat in a cubicle lined up against the wall. And mm. so. To say I, like, lacked in social skills, I think, would be <laughs> mm -hmm. an understatement because, you know, wow. all these other kids in, in, you know, larger schools or at least where you had more than yourself in a grade from a young age learned how to socialize. Yeah. I didn't really. You know, I wow. was stuck in this cubicle staring at a wall except for when we'd have recess. So finally, at the end of my sixth grade year, when I was turning 11 or 12, um, I talked my parents into sending me to the public school. Wow. Mm, big shift. Big shift. Do you, you remember know? that talk? Like, how did that oh, yeah. go? I was just like, I just, I can't. Like, mm -hmm. I was, I was too social. I, I needed interaction. Yeah. I needed, you know, I was in sixth grade doing like ninth grade work. Mm. Wow. Uh, I, wow. I wasn't challenged at mm. all in that. <clears throat> I actually, when I went to public school, I tested out to start high school instead of junior high. But my parents wouldn't let me. Mm. And looking back, I'm like, if you had let me, I might have graduated high school. Mm. You know? <laughs> <laughs> 
I would have had two years up on it. I might have been graduated by 15 then when I left. Mm. Um, but I, um, I would definitely say I was kind of the weird kid mm. because, again, I, I didn't really know how to interact with people. And I was also the weird kid because I was, I was gay. I was different. I, at the mm -hmm. time, I didn't know why. I didn't know why I didn't really fit in with, like, the cool jock guys and this and that. It just yeah. didn't didn't work for me you know did you mm. have a group that you fit in with i i wouldn't i wouldn't say i had a group mm -hmm. that i fit in with but i wouldn't also say that i like didn't fit in at all mm -hmm. i was kind of that kid where i'm like i knew the jocks i was friends with them you know mm -hmm. i knew the cheerleaders I, I knew the people in band like i kind of knew everybody like when i run ran for student council i actually won even oh, though I, I wasn't in a popular group i was yeah. just mm -hmm. everybody kind of knew me and nobody disliked me just nobody was really my best friend you know mm. yeah. so yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what would you spend your time doing, would you say? Legos. Yeah. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time at church. Really? So I would get up at 5 a.m. to go to church to go to prayer meeting before we'd go to school. Yeah, every, every day. day. Every day. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, it was kind of my only way out of my house. <laughs> really? My mom was super, super strict. Um I was never allowed to like go to friends' houses because mm. if she didn't know them, if their parents didn't go to our church, like, you know, I could possibly watch a show I shouldn't be able to watch. You know, I just yeah. wasn't allowed to get out in the world. So I'm like, at least with the church, I could like get out in the world yeah. to an extent to the church. Right. Yeah. Um, so I would go, my youth pastor would come to pick me up before school every day to take me to prayer meeting. Let me do that without hitting the mic to take me to prayer meeting. Um, and then after school, I had to come straight home, like on the bus, yeah. straight home. And so when there would be any activity at the church, any day or night, I would go. Wow. Yeah. I think you've been somewhat outspoken about like how, you know, the one thing you didn't want to do for Career Eye mm -hmm. was go back to a church. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken about how, you know, your relationship with that is obviously beyond fraught, understandably. So, so but, but I, I'm curious if like, you know, despite the organization of religion, despite all that stuff, you know, there's that kind of unknowable, mysterious quality to being alive, mm -hmm. right? What do you want to call it? Soul, whatever you want to call it. I'm curious, mm -hmm. was there a part of you that was was really like, I don't know if it was like mystical or if it was like maybe more community for you? What was what was the part of you that was really enjoying that experience? Or, or was there a part of you that was enjoying that experience? It was the community of it. Right. It was the uh, appearance of acceptance and unconditional love. Mm. Okay. The appearance of it until you were anything different than what exactly they thought you should be, and then it was all gone. Yeah. Yeah. That's really hard. And mm -hmm. and do you recall, because I'm, you know, a person who's grown up and become quite spiritual, and I'm, I sometimes think about, I'm like trying, how did I think about this then? How did I think mm -hmm. about, you know, like God, or how did I think about, um, because I do pray and meditate a lot. Like I know then I was looking towards art a lot and music for that. I mean, w was there, was there an outlet for you where, cause I mean, it's just, just because I don't know of anyone I can think of you that's been on the show. You just, it sounds like you were just like at church all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's a very, very specific experience. Yeah. So, so there's community, which is, which is what we all need, that human connection. Mm -hmm. Was there a, a, uh, you know, I mean, like an outlet for your transcendental longings. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> or, or where, where were you getting that? Was that something that you thought about? You I know? mean, to me, it was just the only thing I knew. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, where I grew up, like that is what you believe. And like yeah. the church, I went to Pentecostal Church Assemblies of God, and I always have to say it that way. <laughs> um, but they <laughs> also <laughs> like they believe like, oh, if you're anything but Assemblies of God, you're going to hell. Like Baptists mm -hmm. are going to hell, Catholics oh, okay, are going right. to hell. Yeah. Any anybody that isn't exactly who you are. So um, heaven is a small place. Heaven is a <laughs> very <laughs> a VIP place. Basically, only. you're yeah. welcome. There's a velvet rope, and <laughs> you're it, not getting it. in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think it was just because it was all I knew. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't until I got out of the world and realized that uh, maybe this was a little wrong. You know, <laughs> you know and I, don't, I don't know if this is the topic of this conversation, but. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I do want to ask, at, at 15, at that point where you sort of made the break. Mm-hmm. What happened? Like, who did you turn to? Because you said you lost everything. That's what you just yeah. said a few moments ago. What was that like? And how did you move forward and move through that? I found my own community. I mm -hmm. found a new community. You know, one of the beautiful things about, you know, one of the, the awful things, but also the beautiful things about the gay community is 
we have the opportunity to find chosen family, mm -hmm. you know, because often our family turns their back on us. You know, I've since reconnected with my family, my family, and I have a great relationship now, but mm -hmm. for years we didn't. Mm -hmm. You know, I found a lot of great people that had either been through it or were straight and were just allies and just good people mm -hmm. um, that really helped me. You know, at one point mm -hmm. I had, um, I had re-enrolled myself in high school um, at Kickapoo High, where Brad Pitt went, and really? multiple, yeah, yeah, we went to the same high school, ten years apart, mind <laughs> you, but the same high school. <laughs> um, and uh, it was only, and I was like, I met somebody as, as this girl whose parents were pastors, and I was living in my car, and she knew it, and so she like would sneak me into her basement every night, Aww. so I could like mm. sleep on the sofa in her mm. basement. Wow. So I, yeah, a lot of a lot of good people helped me out. You said a moment ago that you now have a good relationship with your mm -hmm. family. You were able to reconcile, it sounds like. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What was that process like? At what point did you yeah. reconcile? Did you reach out? Did they? I would say it was about two years after after I left home. Okay. And there were times in between that we definitely spoke. I mean, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't good, but we mm. spoke. Um, I think the first time it really started to get better was my mom actually reached out to me hmm. and like apologized for being wow. a bad mom. And don't get me wrong. My mom was a good mom. Hmm. She was just very misguided. Hmm. You know, yeah. she uh, uh, used rules of raising children from super conservative Pentecostal religion that just weren't great. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't blame her for a lot of it. I, I, I blame the ideas that were put in her head by yeah. other people. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so she reached out to me, apologized for not being who she, I needed her to be. Mm -hmm. And that, that started. And what really made our relationship better is the fact that my parents love my husband. And honestly, I think they love him more than me. Mm. Like Aww. when I FaceTime <laughs> my dad and my dad calls my husband doo-doo. Yeah, doo-doo. Mm. <laughs> yeah, doo-doo. Every time I call my dad, he's like, where's doo-doo at? And Aww. I'm like, what? I, it, am I not enough? And he's like, you know, I just love doo-doo. <laughs> like, all right, all right. Yeah, do it. Come on. Aww, that's um, so sweet. And my, so sweet. My dad and him go riding together. And like mm -hmm. my dad Aww. gave him his old cowboy hat. And yeah, so Aww. I, I I think my family seen me in a healthy, loving, mm -hmm. normal relationship that mm -hmm. has lasted longer than any of the straight heterosexual relationships <laughs> in my entire family. Wow. You know, we've been together 20 years mm. next year. Wow. I, I think that kind of helped normalize it for them. Totally. Yeah. 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 We have a couple of classic questions that we ask every okay. guest. The first question is, can you tell us about your first crush or love and your first heartbreak? My first crush Definitely Marky Mark. <laughs> Marky Mark, the oh. performer. Yeah. What? Is there another is he Marky a Mark? <laughs> it, did he the performer? I only knew he from the underwear ads. Yeah, this is Mark Wahlberg, yeah, right? I only yeah. knew him from the Calvin Klein ad. I didn't know, because, again, I wasn't allowed yeah. to listen to anything like that, so I actually didn't know what he did. Um, I just remember one wasn't time. Wasn't he a rapper when was he was he? Marky Mark? Wasn't That's that right, his like, was, rap yeah. name? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just okay. remember one time seeing that Calvin Klein out of him yeah, in a magazine, and it just... That was your awakening. Got me hot and bothered for years. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. For years. Yeah. The, the, what was it? My first and, crush? And first heartbreak. First mm. love, first heartbreak. Um, mm. My first heartbreak, and I'm going to call him out by name because okay. he's actually a singer here in L.A. His name is Patrick Allen Casey. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a dig. I love him to death. Mm. He's a great guy. But I mean, I was like 17. He was 19. Um, but yeah, he was my first heartbreak. And mm. it was right around the time Titanic came out. It was actually the first, our first date was to go Aww. see Titanic. So when we broke up, I just laid there and listened to such Celine Dion Aww. over and over and over Aww. and over and cried. <laughs> That's very sweet. My husband, just on the topic of Titanic, had never watched Titanic in his uh, life. I don't know how. Until? And, until yeah. just a few days ago. He, went, he had to take, I know, <laughs> he had to take a, a plane to Sydney and he watched it. And then he said he watched an episode of a show and then he watched Titanic again. He's wow. like, you know, it's so good. You, you know, that's so funny because <laughs> it's I, good, I've actually, yeah. I think I've said on this show that even though it's not, it's a genre, like the love story genre is not one that is like my favorite go-to at either. all. Not However, all. Titanic, I, I, I will watch a movie twice in a row almost at any point in time. There's just something about it that is, yeah, that is so, I don't know if I've seen it since that night. I know, I really? need to watch yeah. it again. 
Yeah. Wow. I haven't seen it since high, since high school either. I can remember most of it. Like, Pink me like your French girl. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't let go. I know. I, know. I think I said to David yeah. at then, I was like, do you think Jack could have fit on the door? He was like, it flipped over, Sophie. I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <He's remember>. defending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So the other classic question we asked okay. everyone is if they have like a cringy or awkward or embarrassing story from their tween years that they wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah. Maybe like 13, mm -hmm. we went skiing in Missouri and skiing in Missouri consisted of a, a small hill with fake snow on it right. and it was called snow bluff ski missouri um and we went i had never skied before um and i went down this little bluff and i didn't know how to stop and so i just kept going and going and there was no more snow because the snow on the hill was fake and i ended up like going through the grass doo -doo 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 -doo, and into this huge muddy pond that all the runoff with had went in on. with my skis the on runoff. with oh. my clothes on was it was it deep oh it was deep like, it sounds it like, like you could have died my, I, I could have i could have wow. um but it was a church thing so the lord saved me um <laughs> <laughs> and so i just i'm like soaking wet I'm, i didn't bring any clothes and oh so my. i had to like go into the bathroom in front of people and just kind of like Oof. try to hose myself Oof. off in the sink yeah. Yeah. Oh, in the sink yeah. wow. so that was um my first ski and for you at home I'm, I'm air quoting mm -hmm. ski experience mm -hmm. i did not try it again until i was probably 19 wow. and then i did not try it again until 2015. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what characterized you were, were you a were you a, a were you really quiet i would say i've always been an introverted extrovert mm. Mm -hmm. like in large groups of people i'm very introverted i'm very quiet um Going, being in Hollywood has been very hard for me. Mm. Mm. I remember the first Emmy, Emmys 2018, when we won our first Emmys, like the Ted Sarando from Netflix has his party at his house the weekend of Emmys for mm. everybody that's nominated. And I got there and I was so nervous. I like went Aww. to the bathroom and locked the bathroom door and like put my feet up on the toilet so nobody could see me mm. and just like sat in there for 30 minutes before I could finally come back out. Wow. Um, so even as a child, I was like that. Like none of my friends or family believed that I was introverted at all because like around people that I'm comfortable with, yeah. I'm very extroverted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I've, I've always definitely been an introverted extrovert. Yeah. I've gotten much better, though, at being yeah. able to be yeah. the extrovert when I need to be the extrovert. So what's the experience for you like when, like, strangers recognize you and approach you? Is that a thing? <sighs> um, <laughs> it's, a, it's such a blessing mm -hmm. to be on a show that attracts the most loving, wonderful, yeah. kind fans yeah, that really our does. show attracts. Yeah. That being said, when you do have social anxiety, like Anthony and I talk about this a lot because he's the same way, yeah. um, it can be a lot, mm -hmm. especially when like our show people feel like they, they, know, know, you. they know us yeah. and we're yeah. best friends. And so yeah. it's, it's, I thought I was getting better, but recently I feel like I've gotten a little worse. Mm. <laughs> recently, a lot of people have come up and like, grabbed me oh no but that's They'll just like, so inappropriate they get, but, and 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 to any of you they listening that this happened with, with i love you don't be <laughs> yeah. mad don't be upset i don't hate you yeah. but it's just like they get excited and again like they feel like oh this is just my friend yeah. he doesn't see me i'm gonna grab his shoulder and like i wow. get startled and i'm yeah. Yeah. recently like i didn't react punched well somebody? and i was what's that you punched somebody no that <laughs> almost happened once though wow. i was walking down the street in kansas city when we were filming and i had my earphones on i was coming back from the gym and this woman rushed behind me and grabbed my shoulder and swing me around and i thought i was getting mugged and uh, so yeah. i just like went to punch her and i came like <laughs> half an inch from punching oh her in gosh. the face and i was like oh my i'm like oh my god don't do that and she's like i'm sorry i was in a cab and i saw you and i made the cab stop because i literally just flew into kansas city last night and i was like i'm just gonna die if i see him and there you oh. were and she's like i just i'm so and i was like it's okay it's okay just just don't do that and you're both hyperventilating yeah, yeah you're, both, you're both crying and somebody did it to me in, to, into an airport Shocking. the other day i'm like in oh, the and, lounge, an and i'm like Please, i'm like hun i'm like hunched in a corner mm -hmm. in my watching my ipad like trying to really just i'm like it is i have to my disappear. earphones in yeah. my face is in a screen like i clearly i'm like i don't mm -hmm. you don't want to be bothered yeah. and this person comes over and like pulls my shoulder and I looked, and at first I thought it was my husband, but then I realized it wasn't. So then I was like really startled because mm -hmm. I'm like, why would anybody be touching me? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I didn't react. I, I think it was all over my face. Like, what yeah. the? I don't know if yeah. I'm yeah. on here, but you like, can. what you the can. fuck are you doing touching me? Yeah. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Can we get a picture though? Can we get a picture? <gasps> and his girlfriend or wife was like, I don't 
I don't know if he wants to. And I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. I did oh, my smile. Hard. Yeah. So everybody out there, hey, um, don't, <laughs> don't, don't touch, touch someone you don't, don't know. Yeah, don't touch people. Like, yeah. get their attention another way. Or the yeah. people that um, will, like, yell my name, they're on 100% sure it's me. So they'll be like, Bobby! <laughs> Bobby, I hear it. I refuse to flinch yeah, or acknowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, no. Mm. That's good. Yeah. Maybe they're just like, oh, it's a lookalike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The great thing I have is that uh, when somebody doesn't shout my name or they shout a character name, mm-hmm. it's just it's not me. I'm not. Yeah. I'm yeah. Not to respond. I always yeah. have my headphones in. Mm. There you go. The other day, I was <laughs> shouting his name on a block, and I was like, wait, we need a code name because I'm like alerting all these people. <laughs> I was like, Pat. And then, just for reference, I did definitely say we're not having a code. Yeah, name. <laughs> like, no, that's not. Little buddy, that's not <laughs> little buddy. People talk about parasocial relationships. Yeah. But I mean, you you know, you guys are like you you are the you are you are these you are yourselves, yeah. but you're a personality. Yeah. And you and they are. And you come to help name. people. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like 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 I mean. Um, I just, I just, I would actually think I'm realizing like you have a unique experience in that whole. Yeah. Thing. There will be mornings I am standing in line at Starbucks, holding some woman, bawling her eyes uh. out, <gasps> because she has had an emotional moment with our show, yeah. Yeah. or a family member, and I, you know, yeah. I don't want to ruin that for them, yeah. and so I'm, you know, yeah. in you my mind, I'm like, oh, I yeah. really need a coffee. <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm curious about this arc of like, at some point you got into design. Mm-hmm. At some point you you know, now you know you're 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 here, and it's turned into something you probably never could have imagined. I would think. Uh, I mean, did you ever see yourself turning into something no, that like, right? No, I mean, being famous was never a item on a list of my goals in life. No, and mm-hmm. I and I mean, from what I understand. Uh, you moved to New York and you you started working at like a hardware shop at Bath and Beyond. Restoration hardware. Restoration. Oh, that's hardware. Very, very different, different than a hardware <laughs> shop. Very different from a hardware shop. It's definitely. It's like when I tell people I used to work at the body shop at yeah. DIA Airport. Yeah. They're like, oh my God, you used to work on planes? And I'm like, no, like body lotion. Yeah. That's Puma, the body very shop. <laughs> that's Puma. Uh, that's actually. You, you can smell it now. You just yeah. got transported back to the mall. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> so so, so at what at what point, you know, in your youth, you're coming up, you leave. What what actually what what made you decide New York City? So, um, New Year's Eve, twenty New Year's Eve, twenty twenty two, going into twenty twenty three. I was supposed to go out with friends. A friend of mine ditched me because he thought the guy that he liked was asking him out. But in fact, the guy that he liked was asking him out on a date he already had is just like the third wheel. So it was like, karma. Oh, no. Um, It's a strange thing to do. I'm still friends with that person to this day, so it's fine. (laughs) Um, But so I ended up just at home by myself chatting with people online. And I was chatting on this website, gay.com, which is all there was back then. There was no smartphones. Um, And I ended up chatting with this Kid in New York Wait, City. this is 2022. No, 2002. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. 2002. <laughs> yeah. 2002. Wait, so it's like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, and she's like, oh, you're still friends with this person a year later? Okay, yeah. great. No. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, gay we're like, there's Tinder. There's Tinder. <laughs> yeah, dot com. Two, 2002. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. 2000. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I hit it off with this guy, but honestly, to close the chat window, never mm-hmm. thought anything of it, had a great conversation. A couple, maybe like a month later, two months later, I went to New York to visit another friend. Mm. And I'm walking through this bar, and somebody turns around and walks right into me and spills their drink all over me. And I look up, and it's literally the guy. That's I had a crazy with. meet cute. Yeah. That's like, and I was scripted. just like, Tim? Mm. I was like, Bobby? And we fell madly in love, like mm-hmm. instantaneously. And I started coming out to New York City all the time. And I planned on moving out there in with him. We did not even last long enough for me to move out there. <laughs> madly in love. <laughs> madly in love. Madly in love. For three months. Um, but during that time, I fell in love with the city. And yeah. I just, Aww. I felt it was where I needed to be. So even though I, I wasn't moving out there for someone, I was moving out there for myself. Mm-hmm. Um do you ask how I moved to New York City? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I, so actually, so I also I didn't realize that you moved. ADD. We're going like, oh, all over the place. I, too, I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought I thought I I was I misunderstood. I thought you went from Missouri to New York. So you went from you, Missouri you moved to Denver to Denver. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then Denver to New York. What made you choose Denver? 
I knew one person in the world that didn't live in Missouri, and they lived in Denver. <laughs> is that really true? It's one really person. true. One, I met them on ICQ. Do you remember ICQ? I, I oh, yeah, ICQ. what is that? What is that? I, yeah. It was like the original chatting. Yeah, yeah. before AOL Instant Messenger. Right, okay. It was big in Europe, and That's when you right, got a right. chat, it would make this little... Yeah, yeah, I can yeah. Still it's hear. really cute. Yeah. <laughs> so hold on. So, so you then this is at fifteen, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I met Jesse Sheets. Shout out to Jesse Sheets. Um, I met him. I was probably like thirteen when I met him. Thirteen or fourteen. I met him on like a, I was on a school computer on ICQ, mm -hmm. and he actually helped me like really come to the realization that I was gay and mm. accept myself and love myself. And like, mm. I would go, like he would, he came to Kansas for something once and I like went to visit him when he was there. And yeah, he really helped me a lot. Like he was mm. kind of my only friend in the world that knew who I was because every day at school, I wore that mask. Every day at church, I wore that mask. Mm. Not like the one I wore on Mass Singer, a completely different mask, <laughs> a straight mask. Um, mm. And so yeah, he definitely helped me out. So when I um I was 17. I kind of had a mental breakdown one day. Mm. I was driving a friend to work, um, and the road I went to take her on that we normally go on was closed. So I went to cut through this parking lot, and every other exit of the parking lot was also closed. And I just, like, came to my 1984 Buick Century, came to a screeching halt, and I kind of got out of the car and just, like, sat in the middle of the parking lot. I was like, this is my life. Like, mm -hmm. I keep wow. trying to take different roads. Yeah. I keep trying to take different exits, but I can't get out. Aww. I'm stuck in this parking lot. Mm -hmm. And if I don't get out of this parking lot, I'm going to be in this parking lot the rest of my life. So that parking <gasps> lot was Missouri. Um, <laughs> and so I went to work at the body shop in the mall in Springfield, Missouri. And I told my manager, I'm like, I, oh, I had called Jesse first. And Jesse was like, move to Denver. And I'm like, I have no money. I have no job. I have nowhere to live. He's like, you work on the money and the job. I'll find you a place to live. So he called me and he's like, my old college roommate has a room that you can rent until you find your own place. Mm. So I went to work. I told my manager, I've, I've got to get to Denver. I've got to move to Denver. She disappeared for an hour, came back out. She's like, all right, you're the assistant manager of the airport body shop now. Wow. Um, making $24,000 a year. I was rich. Yeah. Or else yeah. I thought. Um, <laughs> well, at that <laughs> in time, Missouri, at that age. Yeah. In yeah. Missouri, I was. In Denver, that yeah. was, that was yeah. a whole other topic. Um, so uh, that night, I went home, and I'm like, all right, I have a job. I have a place to live. I have no money. And I had this massive collection of DVDs. I won't tell you how I got them. <laughs> um, and and I, I went into Hastings Music and I sold them all and I got like 500 bucks for them. Mm. And I used that to go to U-Haul and I got a U-Haul truck that night with a trailer. And that wow. night I packed everything I own. Jesse got on a Greyhound bus and came out from Denver to wow. ride with me on that U-Haul. Wow. And within 24 hours of having that breakdown in the parking lot, I was gone. I feel like that says so much about you. <laughs> the urgency, yeah. the yeah. like the clarity, the urgency, the action that you saw it through. Like is that something that is yeah. sort of characterizes Absolutely. you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um I also knew that if I I'm a very logical person that really overthinks things and mm. I knew that if I sat there and thought about it, you talk yourself I talk out myself of out of it. Yeah. So mm. I'm like I I have to do this now or else I'm I'm going to ruin this this opportunity. Let's talk about how you got into your current career path. Okay. What was the path to Queer Eye? Yeah. Like I always liked design. I was like always remodeling the the trashy apartments I lived in to mm -hmm. make them more livable and I was always something I enjoyed doing. I just never thought of it as something I could do for a job because I didn't have education mm. in it. And, you know, society tells you if you are not educated in what you want to do, you cannot do it. You must mm. go to college and accrue debt, and then you can work. <laughs> um, so I just assumed I would be working, the you know, in restaurants and, and retail, which is, is great, you know, the rest of my life. Um so then in Denver, I worked at the Bombay Company. You guys remember oh, yeah. that? Yeah. Um, restoration, or no, in Denver, I didn't, that was my first job in New York was Restoration Hardware. Funny enough, the day I got fired from Restoration Hardware, um, Tom Felicia was in the store at the time filming the original Queer Eye. That's oh, insane. Why yeah, did you get fired? Um, so I was a design manager, and so I was in charge of making sure the store always looked good. And so the night before, I was there until 1 o'clock in the morning making sure the store was perfect for Queer Eye coming. Yeah. Oh, my God. That is so And crazy. I forgot to clock us out. Me, oh. me and my team didn't clock out. And so when I went in the next day, and we were supposed to have left at 8, 
When I went in the next day, I saw that the GM just assumed we left at eight and clocked us all out at eight. Hmm. So I fixed all of our time, including yeah. mine, which was a huge no-no to change your own time. Oh. And there was a manager who wanted my job and she ratted me out. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's yeah. so petty. And so I, wow. what? I, um, I got fired. Do you want to name her? No, just <laughs> Candy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it's funny that the manager that had to fire me, like she didn't want to, her name was Calista. She's great. She's still out there. Mm -hmm. When she heard that I got queer eye, she DM'd me and she's like, aren't you glad I fired you? <laughs> yes. That's really sweet. I just think it's trajectory. so funny that we thought it was a hardware store. Yeah, I really like that. <laughs> I really like, oh, you work at Laurel Hardware, a hardware <laughs> store, right? I'm like, well, that's a restaurant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so restoration hardware, and then um, mm -hmm. I worked for a company called Portico, which was a high-end retailer, furniture, spa products. Uh, and I started out as a store manager. I worked my way up to creative director of that company in the end. Wow. I had built their e-commerce division as well. And one day, we all got notifications that the company is bankrupt and closing. Wow. And oh, awesome. Clearly, the owner had not been um, <clears throat> running it very well, and we mm -hmm. just weren't aware. Um, so that night I went in and I cloned the database for the e-commerce that I had built for them and I registered bobbyburkhome.com and I'm like, maybe oh. I'll sell a sofa or two while I look for another job. Wow. Um, and I sold more than a few. I was one of the first online retailers out there for furniture. What? My wow. biggest hurdle was getting manufacturers to sell to me because they're like online. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to buy things online, especially furniture. Mm. We're going to upset all of our brick and mortar stores if we sell mm. to you online. So eventually I actually opened up brick and mortar stores just so I could Whoa. get the product I wanted mm. because they would sell to me then. So I then opened up, I then opened up a store in Soho and then Miami and then Atlanta and then LA um, and the brand started to grow, That's amazing. but I still wasn't a designer. <clears throat> you know, I still never went to school for it. Yeah. Um, but I got a call in 2015 from builder magazine. They're like, Hey, we hired a PR firm to tell us who the most millennial designer was out there. And they said it was you. Wow. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, great. In my mind, but I'm like, I'm not a designer, but great. Mm. Um, and they're like, we are building the show homes for the international builders to show. And they're all about what millennials want in their homes moving forward. Remember and, when people wanted to know what millennials right? wanted? Yeah. <laughs> I know. And now they don't care. The day. Yeah, yeah. They don't care. Um, and they're like, you know, we want you to design the show homes for the international builder show. And they're like, can you do that? And in my mind, I'm like, I have, and this isn't just picking out furniture. This is yeah. like electrical yeah. plants, construction documents, like wow. like actual things you need to know to build a house. Um, but I'm like, yes. <laughs> wow. Yes. Yeah. That's incredible. That's always been my philosophy. Yeah. Always say yes. And actually, no, I say no for everything almost. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> Back then, it was always There's say time. yes. There's a season yeah, for yes. Yeah, this yeah. Is, that, that was my season of yes. Yeah. Say yes and then figure out how to do it. And I think Martha Stewart said that once as well. Like back in the day, like she didn't know how to do any of the things she did mm. now, but she'd always be like, yes, I can do that. Mm. Yeah. What was her tagline? I don't know. It's, I don't a, remember. it's a good thing. Mm. It's a good thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how so, did you How did you quickly learn Google, electrical? Google, and, oh, YouTube. Yeah. You can learn anything on Google and YouTube. And then, like, you need to know CAD for floor plans and stuff. But mm -hmm. I just put them in Photoshop and I manipulated them. I, mm -hmm. I, um, I said to the builder, I was like, hey, you know, I really want to make sure I'm giving these construction packets to you exactly like you like them. So do you have any from, like, past projects that you've done? <laughs> just so I can make sure my <laughs> format matches your format. Perfect. And I just, like, put them all in Photoshop and <laughs> changed them up. A little bit. That's wow. amazing. Yeah. Okay, wait. Uh, you, uh, you're not done with the story, but I have a question uh -huh. for you. Just listening to you talk about your trajectory, there's so many points where I'm like, oh my god, this is incredible that you that you started this online business, and then it's incredible you opened these brick and mortars and all of yeah, these big actually, cities, and then it's incredible too. that like just thing after thing after thing. And I'm wondering, like looking back, it's easy to see the that success, but. At the time when you were going through it, were you recognizing that? Or no. You... no, because I, mm -hmm. I'm my own worst critic. Mm -hmm. That's a strange phenomenon. I've never heard <laughs> <Yeah>. of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it's also, to me, it's never enough. I mm -hmm. always think I'm not doing enough. I'm not working hard enough, yeah. even mm -hmm. though, like, back then I worked seven days a week, 364 days a year. Wow. But it was always never enough. Um, what was the question? <laughs> Yeah, well, just the, ah! just did you recognize? Did you realize you were making it? Like you were no, doing it? No, and I and I honestly still do. You know, like, maybe 
Yeah. 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 And yeah. I, I mean that actually yeah. with sensitivity. Like, it's a, no. it's yeah. a big question. I, I still don't think I, I do enough. I just, COVID, though, really gave me a perspective on work-life balance. Mm. I think it did mm. that for billions of people. Yeah. Mm. You know, I realized that I was, you know, 2019, I flew over 500,000 miles in one year. Wow. Oh. I was in... L.A., Phoenix, New York, London, Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong in six days. <laughs> what? Yeah. What were you doing in Beijing? And Sh- I went to high school in Beijing, so Shanghai, um, Hong Kong. I, my doing? furniture license partner was there. Wow. But yeah, I love Shanghai is my favorite city in China. Yeah, but beautiful. Beijing is awesome. Yeah. 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 Bobby, can you finish though? I mean, like, I want to. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> You're like, you <laughs> also had ADD. No, I really did that. Bad at it. No, 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 no. That was my I wanna, fault. Like, I want. You were like building momentum to the story mm-hmm. of how you got onto Queer Eye. So I just want to. I want to hear it. Um, so that was 2015, built the show homes. So then right about that time, my husband and I had also decided we wanted to move to LA. Mm -hmm. Like we had been in New York 12-ish years. Um, New York, I realized I had Stockholm syndrome and I was in love with my captor. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. No, like living in New York, I'm like, there's nowhere else you could live. There's nowhere else. Like New York City, where else would you live? But then I started spending time in Miami and LA. And and I was like, oh my God. Outside. I'm in love with my (laughs) captor. Mm. I'm like, I've got to get out of here. And there was just like a few like really bad winters and we're like, we're going to LA. Mm. So we moved to LA. I started building my design firm. Um, and so my design firm was becoming successful and Mm -hmm. my publicist one day said, Hey, I heard they're casting Queer Eye and they reached out and they want you to audition. And so I I did a Skype interview, which I thought went horrible. I like, I had like the background set up all cute in my Mm -hmm. loft and everything. It was so great. And then the power went out 10 minutes before. And so I had to like jump in my car and drive. Luckily, my office was only a mile away, but like mm. rushed to my <gasps> office to get there. Yeah. And so I was like all hot and disheveled and mm. red because I'm always red when I'm any happy, sad, Your favorite hot color. And cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my favorite color. <laughs> um, and I thought the Skype interview went horrible, mm. but apparently it didn't. Um, they called me back to come to the in person interviews that was like the, their top 40 choices. Wow. And I almost didn't go. I had a trip to Spain planned that week. Um, I don't know if you know the tile company Porcelanosa. No. They um, were bringing me over to Spain, to, like a whole all expense paid trip all over Spain to like wow. visit their factories, oh, but wow. also that to like cool. to just like yeah. experience Spain. And I'm yeah. like, this is a once in a lifetime trip. Like yeah. I'm never gonna get to do this again. I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna get the show. I'm not going. Um, but luckily, I was supposed to leave for Spain on Friday morning. An audition, like the cocktail audition, started Wednesday nights. So I'm like, I might as well go. So I went, it went well. The next day, they're like, all right, everybody come to this ballroom at this Hilton in Glendale. (laughs) And it was, I sat around, I think, for 15 hours to do 15 minutes of uh, casting and audition. They like had these three tables set up with executives from Netflix, Scout, and ITV. And we just kind of five minutes at this table, five minutes at that table, five minutes at that table. And they're like, all right, so you'll hear from us tonight if we want you to come back. Wow. And so I'm like, okay, well, that. And I was also like, I had the flu. Like, mm. I was like, mm. I, I was just like, this did not go well. So, can I just ask really quickly? Yeah. Did you meet any of the other Fab Five? Yeah, in that yeah, process? yeah. That's when we yeah. all met. Okay. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a delicate process because it has to yeah. be. It's not only like, okay, we're casting this person to be the interior designer. We're casting this person to do yeah. the grooming. It's like, it has to, like to work other. as a group. Yeah. 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 There's, there's a lot of things about that process that eventually probably will come out in one of our books. Yeah. yeah. But it'll be yeah, in right. decades. Like, yeah. Okay. Tell all. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair. Yeah, um, wait. But, like, I remember the, the first five minutes... Tan and Kramo and I like gravitated towards each other and wow. and <laughs> ended up just like Kramo was cold because he's always cold. <laughs> um, and he like took Tan's jacket and like wore Tan's jacket the rest mm-hmm. of the day. And the three of us is like really hit it off and wow. were always with each other if we weren't doing auditions. And then eventually like uh, Jonathan kind of twirled into it and Anthony, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we actually, the five of us, really did like each other and even wow. before we got cast I had a group text with just the five of us oh, wow. that no was called way. Fab Five no, I was no, like no, we're, no, gonna, no. we're gonna get it. I'm putting this Stop out there it. I'm putting this out there but I think at the end of the day like Cute. That's, that's what amazing. the casting people saw mm. wow. they saw that oh the five of these guys they actually really like each other and they oh. really have good chemistry and that's what they're you already yeah. rooting for each other like wow but so that night Thursday night midnight came around I still had not gotten no call. Mm. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'm going to Spain. I think like one in the morning, my phone rang. 
And it was what? David Collins, a creative queer eye. And he's like, hey, 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 I just want you to know. <laughs> we want you to come back. We're going to see you in the morning. And then he was like, without giving anything away, you're our first choice. Aww. And I was like, what? And so then I get there. Without giving and, anything away. <laughs> yeah, right. But the well, funny thing is, the, like, I get there the, the next day, and they had eliminated <laughs> multiple people from all the other categories. But mm -hmm. my category, like, everybody but one person was still there. And I'm like, wait. Yeah. Did you? Uh, you said that to everybody, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> Which I don't know. But mm. at the end of the day, like, that day, they had us doing all this chemistry testing together mm. where they'd put, you know, one person from each category in a room together. Yeah. And we'd have to do these, like, little fake episodes. And, you know, at first, it was always Tan and Karamo and I. Because mm. I think they saw, like, we meshed with each other from literally the moment we walked <laughs> in the room. Wow. And then, you know, they'd every once in a while, they'd rotate one of us out. But the three of us were pretty consistently in there. And then wow. Jonathan and Anthony were pretty consistently in there. And, like, every time one of us would need to, like, leave to go out, get rotated out or go use the bathroom, like, we'd notice more and more people were gone. Mm. And that ballroom was getting emptier and emptier. And then finally, at like 9 p.m., they're like, all right, we're going to take a break. And we all went out to like go use the bathroom, and we looked in the ballroom, and there was no one else oh there. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Wow. And we were like, oh, my God, we got it. And they're like, no, no, <laughs> no, there's actually another group doing a, a filming of a fake episode at a house right now. Now you're going to go do that, too. Wow. Um, and so after we filmed that, they're like, all right, you know, it's in God's hands now, and we're God. Did they really say that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they really said that. It's in God's hands now. And then, and then you were just like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going I'm 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 yeah, to call him out and say exactly which executive said that, but he was like, you're in God's hands now, and I'm God. Oh, he's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We were like, okay, okay, God. Um, and we, after that, we actually so I have didn't... to call you that from now on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, actually. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I still <laughs> call him Mr. God. Um, <laughs> we actually didn't find out for a few weeks wow. after that that we had we had actually gotten it. That's and then incredible. just like a week later, we got whisked away to Atlanta. Wow. Yeah. To start filming. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because casting, I guess, took way longer than yeah. it was yeah. supposed to. Yeah, it sounds to. like a huge ordeal. Yeah. I want to ask Bobby, I need to know a little bit more about what happens in the room, how the sausage gets made. Well, how is it that you... <laughs> <laughs> we debated whether I would say this how or not. How the sausage gets made. No, no, yes. How do you... I don't think I've heard Wait, that. Wait, you've never really? heard that? No. What's funny is that I say it. It's a common phrase. It's a common phrase. I, it is. It is. It is. I say it enough that that I've gotten the feedback like, just stop saying that. I know. So I really want to know. How does the sausage, does the sausage get made? Yeah. How is it that you can do what you do? on Queer Eye in such a short amount of time. You've heard of magical elves, right? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, what you have. Yeah, I go to sleep and I wake up and it's like that. <laughs> Someone else is doing that. <laughs> no, um, I would definitely say I do less now than I used to. Yeah. Um, like season one through four, I was there every single day, hands-on, very yeah. much into it, designing every single little detail. Yeah. I've had the same team with me since season one. Like, mm, they are wow. family to me. We mm. vacation together. Like, Aww. they're they're everything. And so, like, I wholeheartedly trust them. Yeah. And yeah. they know, since we work together 24-7, seven days a week for seasons and seasons, they know the decisions that I would make. Mm. And so now, luckily, I get to focus a little more on being on the show yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah um and and i can let you know the, the reins go to them because again they're we're in each other's head so i i know yeah. i can show up and it's going to look exactly like i would have looked if i was there 24 7 yeah you said that working on the show was emotionally draining and sometimes mm -hmm. you'd go home crying yeah. and i'm just wondering have you found ways to cope with sort of the emotional toll of working on Queer Eye? Well, yes. and actually, can you talk a little bit about why like i mean mm -hmm. i think we probably understand some but like that's that's a lot to come home every day and I mean, the reason being is that we really did have those emotional connections with these people and like yeah. perfect strangers. And when you're mm -hmm. having to not only bear the burden of their emotions and their trauma and the things that be, they've been through and having to grow, but also in order to get them to open up, relive your own trauma. Mm. Because our heroes, the way we get them to open up is that we open up about things that we've been yeah. through. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that we opened up about on our show that we hadn't really dealt with in real life, mm. you know, but we're in the moment and we're like, all right, this person is not opening up. I need to share something about my life that will cause them to forget the cameras are there and just be in the moment with me. Mm. So yeah, there was a lot of times where I would go home and I would cry because I had just ripped open a wound that I had 
you know, bandaged, mm-hmm. I thought, for mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. And, and I then had to emotionally deal with that. And for your question, have I learned? <laughs> I just don't have as much emotion anymore. <laughs> mm, really? Yeah. 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 I've, I've had to. Yeah. I, I mean, I would still say I'm a very emo- I'm still that person that. You know, cries a dog commercial. This and that. You know, I'm still I'm a very emotional person. And cries other than Anthony, yeah, yeah. <laughs> other than Anthony, I definitely cry the most on the show. But Aww. I've I've learned how to not let it destroy me every mm. time. Yeah, mm. that's important. Yeah, we were watching an interview that you did on YouTube. I don't remember the the name, but I was struck because I think you you were given some pictures of different queer eye heroes, mm-hmm. and you were just like, "Yep, this is this person. This is this person." Naming them off like. No problem. And that really struck me. I mean, it makes sense. You spend quite a bit of mm-hmm. concentrated time together. But but yeah, that you really do become very close. Just create relationships. I mean, there's a lot of them that I, I, I still talk with all the time, like Neil Reddy from season wow. two. And I were texting yeah. this morning. Um, you wow. know, there's some I've never seen again. There's yeah. Some I've yeah. never heard from again. But they're, yeah. each and every one of us connect with different heroes in a different way on yeah. a different level. You know, some... Mm. I don't connect with at all. And I'm like, well, this was a week. And then there's some that I'm like, this is my lifelong friend, you know? And there's others where like that hero that I like had zero connection with one of the other fabrics will have a great connection with him. You know, we don't always all connect on the same level. Um, Yeah. So there's, there's some of them that are lifelong friends. So sweet. Penn kind of mentioned this at the top. He he touched on the fact that you had made it clear to Netflix that you didn't want to do anything associated with a church. Mm-hmm. And then there's an episode where you do end up yeah. building a community center adjacent to a church. What was that like for yeah, you? Yeah, they <laughs> – the <laughs> producers – because I remember, like, the very – before we went to film, um, the creator of the show and our showrunner came to take me to launch downtown. And they were like, oh, you know, talking about what I'm willing to do and how I'm willing to open up. And they're like, you know, what's on the table for you? And I was like, honestly, anything. I am an open book. I always have been. I'm like, just do not ask me to do anything with religion or the church. (laughs) That's like, that is my only thing I won't do. So... The Mama Tammy episode. <laughs> they wrote that down, yeah, yeah. and they're like, perfect. Well, so he said, do <laughs> church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the Mama Tammy episode actually aired as the first episode of season two. Yeah. But it was actually the last episode we had we shot. Mm. So we shot season one and two together, and it was the last episode. And there was another person that was supposed to have been in Mama Tammy's place. Mm. And three days before shooting, th- there was a medical emergency, oh, wow. and they pulled out. And so the only hero that had been kind of vetted at all had been Mama Tammy. Yeah. I marched into their office and I was like, no, I'm done. I'm not doing this. Yeah. And they're like, oh, no, it'll be okay. And I was like, 1,000% I am not wow. doing this. I am not enabling a church to do the things to me to other people that they did to me. Like, mm-hmm. I, w- I won't. Mm-hmm. To each their own, but I won't be a part of it. Mm. Yeah. Netflix executives got on the phone. ITV executives got on the phone. Wow. And I was still like, no, 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 wow. no, no. I'll, I'll walk. Like, and at this time, like, we didn't even really know what the show was. Like, yeah. the show hadn't aired yet. Oh, you know? right. yeah. 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 Like, we had, it, it, it was we, w- that day when we finished filming that episode, we were like, well, it was great knowing you guys. We'll maybe see you around sometime. <laughs> like, we, yeah, yeah, we didn't know what the show was going to be. And it wasn't until somebody from Scout, the original production company, Joel, he called me. He's like, all right, you need to do this. Not for the church, but for all the little Bobbies and all the little Joels who are sitting in those churches right now, going through what we threw through. You need to show them it can be better. Mm. And that was the one call that got through to me, and that's the only reason why I did that episode. Mm. Mm. Um, but yeah, the me not walking into the church was real. I actually got in a lot of trouble for that. And mm. the funny thing is, that became probably one of the most iconic it's scenes powerful. of the entire show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they was like, it's gonna be disrespectful. You ruined everything. And yeah, and I was just like, oh, I told you. And that was actually the person that I told from the, at that lunch. I was yeah, like, no church. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. I think also, I mean, it's an important or it's an interesting distinction that it wasn't just personal. Yeah. Your reasoning was, I don't want to enable a church to do the same yeah. thing that was done to me. So it, it's, it's about protecting other people, yeah. which I think, yeah, is an important distinction. Have you watched that episode? Yeah. How do you feel about it? I used it? to watch them all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't watch them all anymore. 
Although oh, but the I, new season is so good, Bobby. I think, I think I've seen um. I like. Where's, I'm my own worst critic. I can't yeah. stand yeah. watching myself no, on I TV. Get it. Yeah. I rarely watch anything that I'm in. Penn only watches things he's in. Yeah, he just, just put a yin yang. That's why I don't on watch repeat. much TV. I just watch. Just you and Gossip Girl on a constant. Mm. God, that reminds me of. It was some Fox show. I know, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Where they were like, I was watching an episode uh, of You the other day, and the the Fox News correspondent was like, You were, oh, I yeah, didn't do yeah. an episode about this. And he's like, yeah. No, I was watching an episode of You. And she's like, oh, yeah, 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 I never yeah. did an episode about yeah. that. It was yeah. like a who's on first. Uh-huh. Yeah, and yeah. it went on and on yeah. and on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, see, that that was actually, I'm almost certain that was a bit. Yeah. I'm almost it's certain. Got, it was, now, you it's sh- happened. I don't, it's, it's Fox no, no, News. No, no, They're pretty <laughs> stupid. That's also, that's also the, that's the common retort. But no, that, I am, I am, I am. I'm a hundred percent. I'm yeah. I'm basically certain that was a bit. Now that has actually happened. I'm sure. Yeah. But I feel like that was a you know yeah. that was a ratings I, ploy. Bobby, we're coming to the close of the interview, but I want to talk a little bit or give you a chance to talk a little bit about your book, okay. and hear maybe what you think about what is the importance of creating spaces? What effect does it have on us, our psyche? So for me, home has always kind of been about safety because not having a home for as long as I did, I I really learned the importance of what that means to be able to come home and feel safe. Mm. And I think that translates into a bunch of different ways. But to me, first of all, home is about safety and and feeling secure. And, Mm -hmm. but also your, your home is kind of like your phone charger. So if you don't get your phone plugged in at night or your cord has a charge in it, it's not going to make it through the day. It's going to die. Your home's yeah. the same way. Your mm. home should be that place that recharges you, re-energizes you. Mm. And my book is all about the intersection of mental health and design. Mm-hmm. So the book is all about a, a figuring out who you are design-wise. You know, that's one of the hardest questions for people to or answers for people to articulate is I'm like, what's your design aesthetic? We don't ask that in the book. We're like, what's your favorite sweater? What's your dream vacation? What's what's your favorite shape pasta? Mm-hmm. You know, those are the things you should think about of, oh, I love an elbow pasta. All right, I like curves. You mm-hmm. know, I would probably like a, a rounded pillow or something. Or like, I like, I love a chunky sweater. Well, you're mm-hmm. going to love a chunky throw. Mm-hmm. You know, so those types of things. You need to fill your home with the things that make you happy and recharge you. Mm-hmm. So it's all about first, like, figuring out what makes you tick. And those are the things that you should be putting in your home. You shouldn't be worrying about what's the latest trends or in magazines mm. or what even I tell you should put in your home. It's all about what makes you happy. There's also a, a chapter in the book talking about either you or somebody you love who've, who've lost a spouse and how to deal with removing their personal things from the home mm. on, on their timeline. But, you know, and, and teaching them how to, to keep a spot for those memories, but also mm-hmm. to be able to move on. Yeah. Um, because if you live in a shrine to the person you lost, you're never going to be able to move on. When I walk into Homes on Queer Eye, there's so many tall tale signs of depression. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Laundry. Um, dirty laundry piled on the floor. To me, I walk in and I'm like, depression. You're- it's not like this huge existential dread yeah. of, oh, I'm a failure. But subconsciously, it's in your mind you did not accomplish that. Mm-hmm. When that happens over and over daily, that starts to affect the rest of your life. It starts to affect your ability to think you can accomplish things at work, in relationships, mm-hmm. and, and with your kids, with your spouses. So little things like that, I, I teach you how to how to look out for them and be like, it's, it's not at the end of the day. It's not just laundry. It's a feeling of accomplishment. Like when you get up in the morning, you make that bed. That is the first serotonin boosting feeling of accomplishment you can get. Mm. That translates into how you interact with your kids when you're cooking them breakfast, mm. how you interact with your coworkers. You already feel accomplished. You feel like you can take on the world. Also, like a, a disorganized medicine cabinet in your bathroom can call, cause road rage. Do you know? What really? I mean? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's say <coughs> your medicine cabinet, like mm-hmm. most of ours, it's stuffed. Mm-hmm. There's so much crap in there. Mm-hmm. And you keep telling yourself you're going to throw away all those face creams that you absolutely do not use anymore. Mm. Um, all, those, all those perfumes that have been in <laughs> there for 20 years that Stop. don't even smell yeah. good I'm anymore. I'm just thinking about my yeah, hair. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, it's we're cutting this. We're cutting right? this. We're cutting this. And way. so <laughs> you get this new, you know, I, I don't even know, nice face cream, but some fancy yeah. face cream. La Mer. You, La Mer. Yeah. That's the one I was trying to think of. I was like, what is it? La Marie? <laughs> 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 I'm like, I know that one's fancy. Anthony uses yeah. it. Um, <laughs> and so you put it up in there. 
<laughs> and you get up, and the next morning you open your medicine cabinet to put on your new face cream, and it falls out and shatters because mm-hmm. there was not enough space for it. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're, you're shattered. Yeah. Um, you get down to make breakfast for the kids. They are pissing you off a little more than they should be mm-hmm. because that's how you started out your day. Yeah. And by the time you finally get in your car and that person cuts you off, you snap. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't have if you had just cleaned out your medicine cabinet. Yeah, it's like you lots know? of small, yeah. Yeah. small changes. It, it teaches you like to take on little things like that. Because yeah. a lot of times people's entire homes will be out of control. And they're like, yeah. I just can't wrap my head around cleaning out. And that's how they become hoarders at some point. But, you know, like start with your junk drawer. You know, mm-hmm. start with something little. And again, that gives you that serotonin boost of confidence and yeah. accomplishment. And you're like, oh, I'm going to go to my closet now. You know, don't spend a whole lot of time in your closet. It's not a fun place to be. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, like in your closet, then your bedroom. Yeah. And, and, you know, so don't take off more than you can chew because then you, if you don't accomplish it, you get that sense yeah. of failure. Yeah. And that, that's, that's a snowball fair. effect. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. Can't wait to read that. it. So, and yeah. nutshell, when is it that's out, the book, uh, September, 12th. September 12th. There's also okay. a lot of pretty pictures in there that go along with everything that we're talking about. Um, you know, also for years, one of the reasons why I didn't do like a pretty design book is design books are really expensive to make. You know, there's mm. a lot of photography that you have to yeah. go out and do. And so since they're expensive to make, you have to price it high. And I'm all about democratizing design. I'm all mm. about people realizing that you don't have to have a lot of money to make your home work for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to have this expensive book. So luckily I waited long enough that I had a large library of my own projects that I've been able to do over the years. And so most of it is all my work. We have a final question. We ask every guest, which is if you could go back to 12 year old Bobby Mm -hmm. and spend some time with him, what would you do? What would you say? Hmm. It's kind of cliche, but I, and then it's literally the theme song of our show. But I would tell him it gets better, mm. Mm. you know. Um, don't believe all the people who told you you're never going to find love, you're never going to have a family, you're never going to be happy. The world will never accept you, because they will. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you for yeah. coming on, Bobby. Coming. Podcast. Uh-huh. I know. Yeah. Suddenly it's yeah. like, wow, yeah, I'm, like, I'm sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the camera adds 10 pounds of gay and the microphone <laughs> reduces it. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah.